Hey everyone, on this week's episode of NYC Round, I have Matt Harrigan. He's the CEO and managing partner for Company Ventures, which is one of the premier venture capital firms here in New York City. Whether you're looking to learn a little bit more about the history of the New York City tech ecosystem, or you're a founder trying to improve your applications to residencies and accelerators, there's something for everyone in this conversation. Let me know down in the comments, what questions would you like to hear me ask a couple of the investors that we have coming up on the podcast? Thanks for coming on. I'm really excited about this conversation because you're one of the, well, I would call you one of the OGs of the New York tech scene. I want to talk about like your perspectives on the future of New York as a tech ecosystem. First, you lead Company Ventures as a partner. What is Company Ventures for folks that may not know? Company Ventures is an early stage um, investing platform, right? Um, we are uh, on our second fund, um, have about $100 million in AUM. Our vision as a firm is to typify and demonstrate what's possible um, when you're part of an exceptional venture community. And mm -hmm. an exceptional venture community, in our opinion, has four parts. One is capital, um, but it's provided as and when companies need it, as opposed to kind of the traditional accelerator model, a residency model, which you may have heard of, uh, where there's an equity exchange to kind of begin the relationship. We work with companies and fund them as and when is appropriate for them. Mm -hmm community uh we run our residency program which has been around for 10 years all space is quite nice yeah. yeah that's the third is space yeah. i think space is actually a requirement um and then the last is principles like we we have a view on how to build companies um what values-based leadership amounts to how hmm. important it is to the foundational culture of that business so those are the four components in our view of an exceptional venture community and like every other firm all right, we're trying to win access to some of the most impressive entrepreneurs in the world. Yeah, and our view is that that product that I've just described is different and valuable, uh, and and has a right to be on even the best cap tables in the world. And we found success uh, doing just that. And then, where does Grand Central Tech come into it? Grand Central, we started as Grand Central Tech, right? And somewhere along the way, um, it really in 2018, when we were renovating our building, evolved into Company Ventures as a brand. So Grand Central Tech is a property of Company Ventures. Got it. What do you look for when you're looking at applicants of the program? What are the qualities? What are the answers you're looking for, the backgrounds? We're evaluating founder talent, right? And anyone who invests at the seed stage and is honest will tell you that um, the companies that where they've had large scale outcomes um, that company at the point of outcome, IPO, you know, major acquisition, is usually quite a bit different yeah. than it was when you got to know them in the first place. And if you know that to be true, then over analyzing the actual business notion itself can be to your detriment versus really trying to understand if this human being you're speaking with has deep domain mastery. Mm -hmm. such that as they go and build this business, they'll move as the business needs to move, but they're capable of doing so because they know all the contours of the business that they're in. Uh, uh, sorry, the industry that they're right, in or right. the business model that they're right. deploying. So we really focus all of our questioning on determining if that person has true domain mastery of the space they're going after. So walk me through an example of that framework in use. Let's say I'm a founder who's at the pre-seed seed stage and I really want to impress you and show you that I know this expertise because I take the point like the company that you start with is probably not going to look like the one, you know, you eventually lead to success. What are the questions I should be thinking to myself? This person, Matt, wants to know from me. Well, I mean, is it random trivia about the industry? Like, <laughs> I mean, it's just, I'll, I'm, let's say you're building a company in the healthcare space, right? Yeah. I, in the course of our conversation, I will be trying to understand how, with what degree of dexterity, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, the payer landscape, you know, um, the, you know, evolving regulatory regime, mm -hmm. you're aware of uh, payment codes, right? And it just, if. I can tell, having evaluated thousands of companies yeah. each year for 10 years, whether or not I'm talking to somebody who's, um, you know, learning a space and has found something really interesting or who knows a space and is building on top of what they know. That makes sense. 
you you have been evaluating you know companies for for 10 years now do you still get surprised like the in the latest grand central tech class for example do you get surprised by any applications or things that people write about or just meeting new people sure i mean i i i view my role as being extremely privileged i get to sit across from people who are telling me what their dream is for yeah. what they want to do with their lives happens to be a business but it's really what they're telling you is this is what i want to do with my life i want right. to take on maximum risk um, and try to build something new and interesting. I uh, just as a as a predicate, I'm always super humbled by the experience. There are always some crazy people building some wild stuff and I think more and more folks are learning that venture isn't right for most businesses. Most businesses should not pursue venture funding. Um, but some people have really great ideas for yeah. a small business and I often find myself in a, a position where I'm like this is not a bad business idea. Yeah, it's a terrible venture business idea, but yeah. it's not a bad. But you can you should keep going with this. Are those the obvious things like can they scale yes. upwards pretty quickly? Yeah. Anything else? Like, yes, yeah, it's, it's usually that. Yeah, okay. uh, or something about it has a very strong local component to it. So let it be a good small business. Every year or two, you'll see a a major um, meta narrative mm. flow through, and obviously, right now it's AI. Yeah, you know, previously there was like a a crypto spike, but it wasn't as in, as profound as a wave. Um, and, and in 10 years of doing this, I've never seen something as profound as what we're seeing right now, where truly all the smartest people are running after this opportunity. Um, and how people will necessarily capitalize on it is still, you know, being debated everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but that everyone is trying to build in it um, is, is not really up for question. Yeah. In very elementary terms, like it almost feels like there's not an after to this one. Like, it's not an after? Yeah, and because you mentioned that there's waves and then there's an after. Right. Period. For this one, it seems like what what could possibly come after AI? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, but exactly um, how to capitalize on it okay. is still an open yeah. question, yeah. right? And you've, you've probably heard the narrative around, you know, Meta is best suited for this or Google yeah. or yeah. Microsoft or the you know the or amazon with aws and all of that's true and so this mm -hmm. question of who actually can capture the value here is a fair one and something we think a lot about but you know regardless before you determine who's going to win it's just is this going to change everything and no one's really debating that point yeah that makes sense um i meet a ton of fa i've met a ton of founders over the last like you know few months uh, who are building really cool companies they have really strong background they have what you're describing in terms of domain expertise they have they're they're working hard to get those customers but they may not have like institutional like connections with investors per se um, and so it is application season what's your message for folks that may be in the future considering grand central tech as as their home for the next you know love to see an application yeah. i think it's the ideal environment in which to build in new york why is that um, because of our approach right we accept 30 companies a year in two disjointed um, cohorts. So it's two groups of 15 offset by six months. Each group gets a year. So six months after you've arrived, a new cohort comes in behind you. Mm -hmm. The day you arrive, there's an, uh, there's an existing cohort already there. So wow. it pulls you into the motion of how yeah. things go. Um, and our approach to programming is very hands-off. Being embedded in a physical space where everybody to your left and right is hyper-competent. It's a culture. Yes. Yeah. And our job as a firm is just to make that motor hum as opposed to placing ourselves at the center of every interaction. Um, so I think it's an ideal environment in which to build. Um, I think regardless of whether or not a founder finds us or, or we're able to get synced up, trying to find those environments is catalytic, moves you further faster in a really profound way. Um, so that's a recommendation I have for everybody is to try to, to find yourself in value add communities. From an application perspective, um, you know, seeking to describe the market dynamic, why it is big, why it is now. Market and timing, you'll hear, those are the things you can't fudge. Has yeah. to be a big market, timing has to be now. So like really trying to get that point across. Um, and then why you, what you know about this space that makes you exceptional. And then the last piece that comes after those three things is the actual nature of the business you're standing up. But like I said, our expectation is that it is going to change. We want to know that you're clever and that your first notion is a strong one. We will dig into it. We will yeah. try to understand the customers for it, but we're not 
um, we don't forget what we already know, which is that these things change. So yeah. we need the other three things to be really true. That makes sense. There was a hotly debated uh, recent tweet about um, whether you should, whether a pre-seed or seed stage founder should have, you know, forecasts and financials in order. I think I, I think I can tell which side of the argument you're on. No, I know uh, I, I know Jenny well. I think, <laughs> I think the world of her, I really do. Yeah. I think she's a, just fantastic. Always yeah, I want to interview her. Yeah. In the New York ecosystem, you should. She's great. She's so smart. Um, we are on the other side of that. Okay. Uh, it's not to say that we don't, this comes back to domain mastery. Like if I start asking you about unit economics and how you're, you think your business is going to operate, mm -hmm. I do expect you to have answers. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was the point she was getting at. Uh, I think so too. So that's that. So in in that regard, we're we're, we're very aligned. But when I'm evaluating a pre seed company, I, I I tend not to pay too much attention to the Excel file. Makes sense. Along. I think because your earlier point, like it's probably not going to look the same. Um, um, I wrote down a tweet that you you made where it was, and I want to read it back to you. Understanding founders' evolving objectives for how they get value for their time and effort begs a new approach to supporting them. So this ties to your modern founder ethos. First, can you summarize it for folks that may not be aware of it? Sure. Uh, we came up with this a few years ago, but it still applies. Uh, time, upside, purpose. Um, I, the, the best founders I know are trying to figure out, uh, I'm going to use the term shortcuts, although shortcuts has like a bit of a negative pejorative to it, but mm -hmm. the, it, it, they want to move fast, right? You have this window in your life when you've acquired necessary amount of skills and network and, and just kind of like viability. Um, and you're trying to get a lot done, a lot out of it. So in our view, you want to affiliate yourself, affiliate yourself with platforms that can get you moving faster. And that is a function of who you surround yourself with, how well networked they are to conduct customer reviews for you, help you find talent, help you find investors, et cetera. So time, find the best founders are always trying to hack time. Value, um, there's this, reality of investing your career in venture startup outcomes that mm -hmm. you're hyper indexed to one outcome. Yeah. A lot of these people um, know other people doing interesting things. That's why everybody angel invests across each other, but we really facilitate that with our platform. Um, so getting the most value out of this critical window in your career when you're kind of um, at your highest potential. And then purpose, which is to say, we find that the best founders we're working with are hyper intentional about how they want to build the business that they're building. And we're not prescriptive. You can care about what you want to care about. Uh, but we just help founders dig into that and have the company that they're building best reflect what their values are and what they care about. That's kind of an issue that actually pops up for many founders that when they're trying to explore, you know, I talked to another founder on the podcast about this, like, how do you find the right thing for you? For you, what are indicators or questions they should ask themselves as to whether or not the thing that they're currently building is the one that they want to? Well, I find the best way to, to get at this is to ask the, it, usually we work with companies with two founders, mm -hmm. is to ask each of them what they're building and why they're building it. Oh, wow. And if you hear daylight. Gonna, yeah, it's an interrogation. But it's I'm in not meant room. to be an interrogation. <laughs> it's, it's actually meant to be clarifying, yeah, right? Yeah. If you hear daylight, yeah. then that daylight multiplies each level down within the company. Wow. So how is your, you know, junior salesperson uh, supposed to speak confidently about what the business is seeking to accomplish on sales calls if if there's fuzziness? So disagreement. So getting clarity. What are we building and why are we building it? Um, is it's not just like it's not for marketing comms. It's so that everybody on the team fundamentally understands what the business is set up to accomplish. Yeah. And the exact product that you're selling and the nature of the, you know, comms language you use for it, that'll swim. But the what never does. Never does. So we find those companies are so much stronger. We run our companies through a workshop and several of them have taken the output of it and put, made it like slide two, slide three of their deck. This is what we do. So it's a big unlock. We, we think it really is very valuable. In part of that sort of tweet that you you put out, you talked about what a healthy, inclusive startup life looks like. Um, what does that look like to you, like a healthy, inclusive startup environment? And where, in your opinion, have startups gone wrong in that area? Hey, before we get to their answer, I want to take a quick second to just thank everybody that's been a part of the NYC round journey so far. 
If you've enjoyed these conversations we've been having with investors and founders, like, subscribe, and comment down below. Now back to the conversation. You're trying to maximize the potential of each of the initial decisions that you're making. Mm -hmm. um, and you know when you're when you're making hires and forming culture, um, this isn't. I'm not standing on some DEI soapbox. It's to say, um, if you walk into that process with a predetermination as to who will be most successful mm -hmm. in your company and the community that you're forming within it, I think that's a mistake. You're walking in and, and necessarily with a whole set of biases as to what typifies success, what schools they went to, what they look like. And I think it's really important in the early stages to challenge a lot of those preconceived notions because a lot of them are wrong factually. Um, so you see, um, you know, in our case, we work with uh, CUNY, the City University of New York, largest urban mm -hmm. university system in the country. And we have found year in and year out that there is exceptional talent embedded in that um, university uh, infrastructure, people with profound grit, people with really um, clever notions of how to leverage social media for visibility, um, people who can speak to different demos more authentically. Um, and the founders we work with who have embraced that channel just as one have been really uh, stunned by the level of value they can get out of thinking differently about their hiring processes. Now, the flip side of that is as a founder, you have no time and everything's on fire. So it's it's quite an ask for anyone to say, but make your pr hiring process massively more complex. So I get it that why founders use shortcuts and they go to the universities they went to or whatever it is, they, they deal with tight communities. We have the capacity, given our infrastructure, to kind of nudge founders in different directions without asking too much of their time. And the effects have been really profound in terms of people being like, oh, I, I didn't even realize I can think differently about the people who I bring on at the earliest stage and set this company up to have the most holistic and interesting, thoughtful perspective on what we're building. Yeah. What about time allocation, like throughout the week, like some, I know some startup founders that are like, we work seven days a week. <laughs> and oh, I'm never prescriptive about that thing, but I, I whatever works for them. Yeah. I'll, I will say, um, this this is hard work yeah uh and the companies that i've seen really accelerate the fastest are are putting in the time yeah um so if that's seven days a week or six days a week or, or how many hours you stay late, I, I like i won't speak to that but like we do pay attention to the teams that are grinding because it's a grind yeah. this is extremely hard you not no one's entitled to wake up in the morning and create a billion dollar business there's a million other people trying to stop you from doing just that yeah. because your billion dollar business means taking customers from the rice so if you're not willing to put in the effort and you think you're entitled to a billion dollar business you're wrong yeah uh, i think well by definition should... it's like there are so many things trying to kill you yes. like neil degrasse tyson I, I watched a video one time of him explaining to an audience that were like I don't think all of you recognize just how many forces are trying to kill the earth right now, whether it's like if you move one degree outward inward or, or too cold or too hot, there's asteroids trying to kill us at any one moment. Our universe theoretically doesn't make any sense. Um, so I've just observing like other startups, those that have a hyper conscious aware awareness of time and how much time has passed generally are the most successful. Yeah. Bias towards speed is yeah. critical. Yeah. Um, and then the other part of the tweet was educated, quote, educating themselves on emerging paradigms, end quote. What are the signs to look for um, to become aware that a paradigm is happening? <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. Um, you know, before it was crypto, right? And I think that crypto asked a lot of questions which are enduring uh, around um how you can achieve distributed ownership and track it through time. And I, I think that, that that question hasn't been fully answered, but I'm still really interested in it, in the answer of it. Because um, if you have that figured out, you can do a lot of things differently. Um, I think, so that was like a paradigm where even if your business was not itself interested in becoming a blockchain company or becoming a stable coin, it was worth thinking about what the advantages might be of distributed ownership over time. Um, 
and whether or not crypto was the best means of, of accomplishing that. And I still think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Obviously, right now, the paradigm is AI. And the question is really around, um, you know, what, assuming that I can query and derive a tight answer on any data set and, and in natural language, uh, what are the types of customer experiences I can deliver? Whether that's D, you know B two C or B two B or any derivation thereof, B two government, um, and everyone's kind of asking those questions right now. And it's listen, it's it's fair to say that be careful, right? Because some of the foundational players themselves, whether it's OpenAI or Anthropic, they may build the application layer on top of themselves um, and own that too. Um, so, so there, there, there's some reticence as to, as I said before, yeah. where you find the value. Um, but I think it's right for people to be asking themselves those questions, regardless of who the winner is. That's like the burning question right now to me. Makes sense. The crypto one is weird for me because I, I remember like back in college reading Blockchain Revolution by the Tapscots. And um, it seems interesting to me that the most viable models for crypto today are the ones that rely on intermediaries versus like the original idea being getting rid of them mm -hmm. um so well they I hope asked that, the question how yeah, interesting would yeah. distributed ownership be but it never in, in a lot of cases yeah. didn't didn't compellingly prove that it was the technology necessary to achieve that crypto is very expensive energy time uh teaching people new things uh databases work really well we've had them around for yeah. years right yeah. so there was, there was the rub of it that they were uncovering powerful notions, but not always proving that crypto was the means necessary to get do there. It. Um, I, th I think trust is a big issue, but I also don't really see a problem with, you know, those, those waves that you described, crypto being in this place where we're past the 2020, 2021, because back to your earlier point, the people with the most conviction are still there. Yeah. They're still building that. So I don't think it's necessarily a problem if you're indexing on the success of crypto ultimately. For sure. Waves yeah. come and go. This one is, this one in my opinion is is really different. Yeah. Um like the 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 profoundness. The, look at the number of people who have visited, you know, ChatGPT within the first like 3 months of its launch. It's way yeah. past technologists. The yeah, world too. felt different. Pure hobbyists, yeah. November 2022, it felt different before and before and after that moment. Um, the I used program. to, it's funny, like New York doesn't really have cabs anymore, which I miss. You used to talk to your cab driver. For some reason, you don't really talk to your Uber driver in the same way. But like I used to talk about it as like the cab driver test. Mm -hmm. And like it took a little while, but eventually you were to a point where like all your cab drivers were kind of talking about crypto or if you listen to what they were listening to, they're listening to crypto. And I think, it not, I would bet if you did the same cab driver test today, they're all aware of what's going on with the AI. Yeah. It's just a, not the single out cab drivers, just to say, you know, normies have, yeah. have, have, have come to understand. Well, they, they, it's also the opposite, though. They, they say uh, if your barber starts asking you about crypto, that, that's that time to sell. End of it. yeah. <laughs> so. Maybe cab drivers in the middle and barbers. Yeah. 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 We got to come up with some interesting index for this. Yeah. Um, okay. The other thing I want to talk to talk to you about, given you've been here um you know, building in this in New York, uh, whereas others are, you know, going to the Bay Area. Where does New York sit in terms of startup ecosystems in your mind? Rankings. Give me a ranking. Yeah, the way I describe it to people, like there's the often this conversation about New York versus San Francisco. And I'm less interested in that. The way I describe it to people is New York is, in my opinion, and I think the data bears this out, a top five ecosystem in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a phenomenal accomplishment. Where yep. where we are in relation to San Francisco is almost irrelevant. I, I, if you just view it from that prism. And the other point I'd make is um, we are, you know, much more robust from an industry perspective. Everybody kind of knows that. There's a quality of life in New York that appeals to a lot of people, uh, myself included. Okay. Yeah, It's not quite as much of a monoculture as what you'd find on the West Coast, um, which I love. You know, I used to say back in, it was like 2015, the biggest unicorn in New York in 2015 was Hamilton. Right. And that was awesome. Yeah. Um, and then the other point is that uh, it's, it's just much more um, capable as a tech hub uh, in terms of our relationship to Europe. Right. You can, you can have a working day yeah. with Europe from New York in yeah. a way that you can't in San Francisco. And I think that's been a big draw as well. And, and that's why you're seeing a lot more European VC and European companies creating their hubs in New York. So I hadn't heard that one. A few observations. Interesting. Um, okay. 10 years ago, how does it differ from today for you? Uh, I, like 
What massive. have you observed? When we built Grand Central, the reason I built Grand Central mm -hmm. Tech was because I was, you know, socially friendly with a number of people who had had successful outcomes at the first gen, Google, Facebook. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to build a new company. And there was no place to build it in New York. That Like, there were some co-working spaces, but they were, like, you know, too about the keg in the corner and the ping pong table. They there weren't really about building seriously. Yeah. And then there were some accelerator programs, but... You know, they're charging 7% for a hundred grand with founders who had been around the block and they were just, weren't going to take that offer. Um, and so I said, there has to be a physical answer where great people can expect to build amongst other great people, where we do not insist on any equity exchange to start the conversation. Um, we will invite these people into our community. We will add value and as and when they are raising capital we will participate on their terms, not ours. Hmm. And that was a totally new notion. And I think a good one, why we're yeah. still around yeah. 10 years yeah. later. Um, and it still kind of powers who we are as a firm, right? Like we're gonna set the table, you're gonna benefit from it. And as and when you do, we would like to come along. To it it also addresses like one common frustration point I see from folks that have considered New York. Um, it's the, the cost of office space. It's, it's, it seems simple, but it's funny, you know, so much of what founders um, think about in terms of how to derive value from early stage venture firms is colored by the massive marketing effort of early stage venture firms to tell them what to care about uh, so that the determination is favorable to that, right? Yeah. My whole point of view on this is if you sat a founder down and kind of wiped the, the brainwashing off their frontal lobe and just said, well, you're just starting your company, like seriously, what would be most helpful today, right now? Yeah. Uh, and my, my, my research has shown me that founders will often say, I can't figure out this space thing. I might need five desks. I might need 12. Like uh, we're, we're, I, we're raising right now. I don't exactly know how to forecast where, what we'll need. We might hire some people in Brazil or Bulgaria. We might hire them all in New York. Like I don't want to plant any flags, but I need an environment in which to build. So I'm not in my office or a coffee shop. Like I, I can tell that I'm not moving with full speed. Right. And I'm like, got you, got you. I'd like to be amongst other founders who are really great and, and, and capable and are plugged into all the other great venture firms in New York. Got that. I don't want to be beholden to any one venture firm. We don't take equity as a condition of entry. Like you, you can potentially build and not involve us. Like we, we prefer to get invested in all of our companies, mm -hmm. but that's, that's still on the table. Like you're not beholden to us. Uh, got that. Right. Like, and all these things, when you kind of put them all together, just kind of make for an ideal experience for the founder and we happen to be able to benefit from it because we get a chance to invest in great companies that makes sense and i think i got a hint of your answer to this next question in a previous response but what do you think has held back new york's ecosystem prior to 2024 2023 and covid um talent Ta it sounds like talent uh, you mentioned investor incentives potentially like yeah, 7%. the money's here. The money's here now. Um, yeah. You know, all the big firms have set up an office here, right? The, the money's here now. It's It's been a talent question. Yeah. Um, and I think New York has steadily closed the, the talent gap versus the Bay for sure and just has has improved in and of itself. But that's always the thing. Yeah. The, the, the game is to find the most exceptionally talented people um, oriented towards a large market, the right timing, Get get aligned. Company Ventures just announced the latest cohort at uh, Grand Central Tech. Any, like, you know, are there two to three that are, like, nope. particularly exciting? Nope. It's all of them. All of them. <laughs> all of them. Uh, so tell us all, a little bit about all my class. children. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a profound, um, profoundly talented AI cohort. Um, and as to be expected. Yeah. Um, most of the companies are building in AI um, or leveraging it uh, into a specific industry area. Um, we were just really surprised by how qualified some of these people are given their past experience. The like previous exits or? Yes, previous exits or instrumental roles wow. at companies you, you've certainly heard of or, or seminal research uh, on white papers, you know, the likes of DeepMind. Just a really 
impressive cohort. And, you know, we do this exercise when we first initiate a cohort where we ask all of the founders to brag about themselves. And what we say is, if we run around the room and each of you just says, hi, I'm so-and-so from here and there, none of you has the instinct to brag about each other. And yet, when each of you goes home and your spouse, partner, friend says, who else is in there? What you'll want to tell them are these moments yeah. of like, this is this impressive person I get to spend my time with. So please give everyone that line yeah. that you would want said about yourself. And when you give them that prompt and allow them to be immodest, um, it's profound. And oh. everybody walked out of this room being like, oh, holy crap. Like a psychological insight. People. Interesting. Yeah. The data point that most excites me, at least recently, about New York's ecosystem is that I think in Q1, there were more seed stage founders here in New York than there were in the Bay Area. Okay. What most excites you about the future of New York City? Well, that's the data to track, right? Yeah. Um, total dollars into the ecosystem, San Francisco is going to be winning for some time just because it has more growth stage companies. But yeah net new companies created. That's the data we tracked. And in that point, New York has reached almost full parity with San Francisco. So you're right to be excited about it. Um, I think that um, more and more folks are building um, venture-backed tech companies in New York. Uh, I think that New York is the most incredible city in the world. Mm -hmm. I've been around. I, I just, it's an amazing place. Um, I'd like to see us achieve more scaled outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's um, something that everybody building in New York is aligned against. And, and there are a number of great companies um, that are, you know, poised to be that into the next generation. Um, you know, one of the challenges with New York is there are so many giants walking around New York that even when we have a great outcome in tech, Sometimes it can not get the level of attention and, and uh, appreciation it deserves just because there's so much else going on. Yeah. I think New York is um, more impressive than it gets credit for in terms of prior outcomes. You know, even Bloomberg, for example, I was a tech company. It, you know, it's evolved yeah. into a media apparatus, yeah. but that was a major tech company, right? So it's just to say we almost don't give ourselves credit. There's so much tech in the banking sector. There's so much tech in the hospital systems in New York. So many foundational things. Like I, you know, I found my doctor through ZocDoc. Right. That's a New York company. So yeah. it, it's, it's, um, I get that there are pure tech companies, Meta, Coinbase, West Coast base, but um, there are plenty here, have been here and are embedded in the rest of industry in New York. And that's kind of the difference. That makes sense. Well, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing in company ventures. So I really appreciate you taking time to chat with me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.